I'm joined right now by Super Bowl 35 winning head coach Brian Billick. And I wanted to talk to you, sir, about that deception and trickery. Because coming into the game on Sunday on NFL.com, you did seem very confident in a Ravens victory. What was your take on the outcome after that, after, after having felt pretty confident heading in? Yeah, I think most people felt like there was a team that could take on New England in Foxborough because we've pretty much capitulated that it was going to go through Foxborough from about midseason on and that, that we felt the same way about Denver. Who could go into Denver and win? Who could go into Foxborough? But of all the teams, Baltimore had the pedigree and the matchups. The big question was, would that secondary – of Baltimore's, which is really, really bad. They've been through six, seven, eight different iterations of that secondary. Was it going to hold up against Tom Brady? The fact that he didn't throw the he didn't run the ball, other than the one quarterback sneak, there was not a called run in the second half. So clearly that's what they were going after. In terms of the formation and the deception, uh, that's I think John uh, will look back and, and recognize that's an emotional response. I mean, you've already talked about it. You know, snap count, shifts, motions, play action pass. The fact that Julian Edelman, who was a quarterback in college, has not thrown a double pass in his entire career in New England is that deception that, oh, we shouldn't have done that. That's not fair now. You need to have shown that to us in the previous four and five years that Julian Edelman's mm -hmm. played for that. So I, it's kudos to the New England Patriots for doing it the way they did. I do think there will be discussion by the league saying, okay, we need to be a little more uh, demonstrative by the officials because you do have to report um, about – about who's reporting for what. We normally see it on the goal line. The big lineman comes in, reports eligible on the end. This was unique, but clearly legal. But we saw Shane Vereen report. We saw it, and then they announced it. Uh, and then that was seconds before the Kent State quarterback threw, threw a, right. a perfect pass. I mean, he just – because he had no nobody in his face. It was a wide-open field. He basically had to lob it. It was a softball. It was unique. It's typical of Bill Belichick, who's maybe the best situational coach in the game. Uh, obviously, tactically and strategically used at the right time. Completely legal. There'll be talks about it in the offseason. And, and the only thing that will come out of it is the official will have to be a little more demonstrative. Mm -hmm. John Harbaugh is wrong in that we, don't, we didn't have time to adjust. Well, they didn't substitute. Uh, it, it, uh, you, you have time to get your personnel in. That's very clear cut because they don't want this running on of personnel. The defense has time to adjust, and the officials will step in and slow it down when you bring in large personnel groups. But they had time to do that. What they didn't have time to do was recognize that they were in unique positions. Coach Brian Bell joining us on the Rich Eisen Show. I am Susie Schuster in for Rich Eisen. Coach, let's face it. This is not a tea party. Chris, Chris Law has been complaining and whining all week about it he likes being to complain more, <laughs> deception and trickery and quite honestly rich had a little bit of complaining but he's a bitter jets fan well, as, as a as a self-professed patriots homer yeah. i thought it was spectacular i thought it was fair it's in the rule books i love tom brady gloating afterwards and my friend krista smith who's joining us later would say that's just because i'm a tom brady homer he's married to giselle that's perfect i get it the whole thing there's a rule book this is not a tea party. You, you win. You do whatever it takes to win. As a coach, do you agree with me on that? Oh, sure, in terms of I mean, you stretch those limits every place you can. Let's remember, and will anybody get away with it going forward? Unlikely, right. because now the focus will be brought to it. Remember during the season when St. Louis ran that brilliant punt return where, where they took Stedman Bailey yeah. and literally, and I can't imagine how they orchestrated that, but put Tavon Austin on one side, the entire forget the team they were playing, followed him there when, in fact, it was punt left. Stedman Bailey ran underneath it. Great deception. That is that any more deceptive? Is that any more illegal or Bush League than what New England Patriots did? I, but, I don't think so. My, now, my, will anybody fall for that again? No, it's not going to happen now that it's happened, but uh, kudos for them. Well, to the, tr the, the truck's been backed up on me twice already in this short <laughs> half-hour program, mm. so I just want to kind of defend myself. We're, are, you're, you're coaching, and obviously – you're on the sidelines, and you're the defensive coordinator, let's say, because Harbaugh's uh, probably not calling in the substitutions in the place for defense. And Bill Vinovich makes that announcement that Vereen is eligible. And then seven seconds later, the snap happens. How are you supposed to adjust to that that quickly? That's where I have a problem with it. It's just the timing and kind of the cheapness. The play you just mentioned, the ramps, that is great design. That's film preparation that's getting there. But kind of bending a rule in whoa, whoa, whoa. There was no, bending, no bending of, of the, the rule. rule. They, they completely fulfilled uh, the, the letter of the law in the rule. And the fact that Baltimore, the first time, what's the old saying? You know, fool me once, shame right. on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. 
And it was clearly an orchestrated series, yeah. one leading to the other, and Baltimore never adjusted. I guess, I guess I should have taken the approach of I give them credit for knowing the rules and doing it to their advantage. The rule needs changed, or that person, I don't know, what, what do you need why, to do? Why are we into changing rules just because it doesn't go in our favor? What's the... Because I think I, you'll see a re-emphasis of them saying different that the than... official needs to be more demonstrative, the fact that they did it where they did, but you know, like I said, it, uh, it's much ado about nothing. They deserve the win. I thought Baltimore was going to win. They uh, they did a great job of coaching. I got to tell you already, we're going to have to have you on for the second segment if you don't mind. Because <laughs> I mean, before we get to that, because we, we, we can talk about changing the rules for the Des Bryant catch for the football act. I love when people call it a football act. It sounds so official. Hmm. Do you, did it, did the kid catch the ball? Was he trapped? Did he reach out? That's one I think that could get reexamined. But when you have a rule book and when you when you can do deception, when you can have trickery, make it part of the game. That's what makes football interesting. Coach, when, to me. when you were coaching, how many plays would you run a game on offense, and it was considered success, sixty to maybe seventy? Well, Chip Kelly runs hundred now. In yeah, which which plays. at the end of the day, and we saw with Oregon, how's that working? It's true. Right. No, you know, true. you don't get points for just running plays. And, and so that whole style, I think, is going to come under a little scrutiny. He's been very successful generating the statistics with it. But in terms of can you win with that, I, I've long said I think this style may go down as the run and shoot of the 2000s. Right. Great yeah. up and down between the 20s, but, but uh, limiting when you get inside the 20. And can you win a championship with it? Coach Brian Billick will stick around with us for another segment. We've got a lot more to talk about on the Rich Eisen Show. Stay tuned. Stay put. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the Rich Eisen Show. I am Susie Schuster in El Segundo. Rich is taking a very much needed personal day. I am selfishly hogging Brian Bilk and keeping him here for a second, second segment. And you were on that Calvin Johnson game. So tell me what you saw when you watched this game on Sunday. You know, it was interesting because the Calvin Johnson game in Chicago was one where the first time we heard continuation of the process. And I, I wasn't aware of that rule to the degree. And I always, a very true story, I had done the game and driving back to the airport. Uh, to, to fly out here to do my shows for the NFL Network. My 90-year-old then mother, who obviously, like all mothers, watches and listens mm -hmm. to everything I do, she said, now, explain to me why that wasn't a catch. And so I'm trying to explain the continuation rule and via the process. And in only the way that a 90-year-old can said, oh, my, that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what the rule came about was, just like we're having right here, all of us could sit and say, oh, that's a catch. That's not a catch. And the varying opinions, they wanted to try to remove... The, the, the objectivity or the subjectivity out of it and saying, okay, it has to go through the process. That The only problem I have is that act common to the game was indeed, because clearly the ball fumbled via the process. Mm -hmm. So within the way the rule's written, it is absolutely not a catch. But what you could argue was, well, what I'm ambiguous about is what's an act common to the game? Was him trying to get to the goal line? Is that not an act common to the game yeah. that that's indeed what he was trying to do? He ha felt like he had control, just like Calvin Johnson. He caught the ball. He took two steps. The hand went down to the ground, and he just left the ball. It's okay. It's a touchdown. I'm going to leave the ball there and go off. I would argue that that was an act. That was a continuation of the act, a football that, act. that says I'm in control of this. So that, if those that want to complain can complain about that, but the way the rule's written, through the process, that absolutely was not a catch, unfortunately for the Dallas Cowboy fans. No kidding. And it also takes a little passion out of the game. That's my concern, is that the league leads sometimes on this. Um, We've done a lot of that, though, have we not? And I'm all for, I'm, I'm not one for the big demonstrations or after, the one I hate most is after a first down. Mm -hmm. It's a friggin' first down. <laughs> There's going to be 50 of them in the game. Do you really need to do the, you know, the, the end zone okay to a degree? Uh, because the kids emulate it, obviously. But I, I don't know. Is that going to diminish uh, uh, Des Bryant's passion for the game? I was with uh, Nate Burleson yesterday, and he was trying to explain. He disagreed. He thought it should be a catch. A catch. Now, Nate was on that Detroit team sure. that in that game in Chicago. Oh, wide so receivers Nate, thought it was, that it was a fun, catch. It was interesting. Shocking. Nate was doing a demonstration. And he was showing how the ball moved. And his, in his demonstration, he said, and the ball gently touched the ground. <laughs> I loved his word, he, gently, as though it really shouldn't have counted. Peyton Manning, let's shift over to the well, other game. Is this the last we've seen of him? Boy, you know, I, I thought after the neck injury before, like so many, boy, this is going to be a lot to come back from. Uh, but we, there are so much left to be told of this story because him going forward – 
it's all interconnected. It has to be. It's inconceivable to me that John Elway did not consult with Peyton Manning in doing the things that he did. A, obviously letting go of John Fox. And I love the term mutually agreeing, which <laughs> simply means you're fired. Am I getting paid? Yes. Okay, we mu love mutually it. agree, and I'm moving on. The fact that they told all the assistants, which is very rare, that you're all free to go. You, we will not encumber you from pursuing other jobs, even though some of them have contracts that they could have said, no, you know, you have to ask permission. Some of you, we weigh money. The fact, they're clearing the decks, and it's hard for me to imagine. I could be totally wrong, have no inside information on it, but it's hard for me to imagine that Peyton Manning would sign off on, okay, let's change the head coach. Probably going to lose my offensive coordinator. I've got a lot of guys up, you know, in terms of both Thomases and, and a lot of people. This, this landscape could change. And I'll come back amongst all those changes. Hard for me to imagine that's going to happen. I mean, the rumors flying on, of course, Gary Kubiak. People were saying Shanahan family coming in. God knows. But I don't see Peyton Manning as being the kind of guy that's going to, for one more year. But, but, yeah. but then, to, but really, again, I, I find it sad to think that the last we're going to see of him would be that it dejected would. walk down you the You know, tunnel. when my last year, Jonathan Ogden played his last year and then retired. And Jonathan had a severe foot injury. And, and basically had to shoot up every game. And so when the season was over, Jonathan very much wanted to continue playing. But at the end of the day, he said, Coach, I, I just can't do the rehab mm -hmm. again. I just can't go through an entire off season the way I know I'm going to have to to get to the point to compete at the level I want to compete at. The last thing Peyton Manning wants to do, I believe, would be come back and limp through a bad Absolutely. year. Absolutely. With a new set of maybe receivers, a new offense. I mean, the offensive structure is a new change. set of vertebrae. Yeah, I mean, no, we don't want to see it go out this way. It has it Did diminished his legacy? It, what, what, when it comes time for the Hall of Fame, we're going to delay it by 30 seconds and announcing it because he didn't have a great last game or didn't have a great last Super Bowl. So, uh, yeah, it's unfortunate that this is the way it ended, but it's hard for me to see him going forward. Would you I want to mention the Coach's oh, Show sorry. podcast, Dick Vermeil is on this week. Chris Law, what do you have? Well, I was just going to ask, do you guys consider Peyton Manning's time in Denver a success and a, a win for all? I mean, he, he won one more playoff game than Tim Tebow did there. He obviously got him to a Super Bowl also, but... I don't think anyone's giving him any slack had he bowed out after the, the Colts with four neck surgeries and doing that. When, when time, when we look back on this, when he is getting inducted five or six years down the road, will the Denver era be looked at as a success or, or a failure? Well, in this league, there's only one success. It's win the Super Bowl. And I think there'll be scrutiny. And, and I, don't, I don't care for it because Peyton Manning is a guaranteed Hall of Famer in the discussion of one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. But Warren Sapp talked about yesterday, and I may mangle the numbers here a little bit, in terms of nine, nine opportunities, nine playoff losses, mm -hmm. something like five at home, six at home, and five of them after it being the one or two seed, which means he had a week off. So now, and Tom Brady gets the same thing. Well, look how many interceptions, look how many games he's lost in the playoffs. That's because they've been good enough to play so many playoff games. Their body of work compared to most quarterbacks is double that most quarterbacks. So by the sheer numbers, you're going to have more of those things. So I don't believe you can diminish that legacy. If you choose to and want to get in the discussion about the greatest quarterback of all time, then certainly you may bring those things up. I think Peyton Manning has uh, 57 million reasons to think why his time in Denver was a success. Yeah, not a, not a bad one, huh? I'd agree, but knowing him the little right. that I do, I think he's going to stew on it for the rest of his life. That guy's a competitor. I hope not in the same way that, you you know, uh, Dan Marino, does he, you know, Warren Moon, right. who I coached, stew on the fact that they never had a Super Bowl win. Is it one of those things in your back of your mind, missed opportunity, regrettable? But I don't, like you say, I think there's more than 57 million. It's probably 157 million reasons why Peyton will go, okay, now I'm going to go do this. smile. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well done. Thank you. That's why I'm here. I know you were looking forward to bringing it to Rich after, after last night's I'll, I'll national get that. We'll get that game. done. We'll get that done still. I, I'm sure he's listening. KLAA. You want to do the poll question? Is that what you want to do, I'd love to hear Coach's opinion on the poll question. Okay. Wouldn't you, Brockman? Yeah, sure. Coach, we got uh, R&B artist Tank here today. And so we were wondering, what, who is the best single-named male singer? I'm taking a little heat on Twitter because Meatloaf <laughs> apparently is two names. But wow. Bono, Prince, Sting, Meatloaf, or Drake? 
or if you have an other. I don't know. Do you know who Drake is? Three or is? no, and, but yeah. but uh, <laughs> you know I'm going to go more old school with with Sting. I happen mm-hmm. to like Sting, and so that's it, it's it's distinctive Bru- enough. All right. that, There's uh, a vote for Sting. For I Coach. went with Bruce. The boss? Yeah. Well, that's not a legitimate one, right? I feel like I feel like when it comes to Bruce, he can do whatever he wants. He can wants. do whatever, do you right. Know what I mean? Right. Coach, thanks for having us. Will you Thank come you. back again when we will I'm do here? It. We I will might, do it. I hijack the air whenever possible. That's it's, fine. It's, it's, it's only clear. when you're here, though. If Rich is going to hide from me, I'm only going to do this with you. That's all I want to <laughs> hear. Jake Leaser joins us to close out Hour 1. I'm Susie Schuster, and this is The Rich Eisen Show. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern. On Audience. <laughs> 